Welcome everyone. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have you here. I'm very grateful for this opportunity. You know, I think uh, when, when Timo was talking and giving the introduction in the background of this program, one of the things that he said, I think are, it's um, very true. And one of the reasons that implementation science and implementation research is, is really a passion for me. And, and that is that when we have scant resources, and we always have scant resources, right, to tackle the, the huge problems that we're tackling in our various countries, um, research becomes even more important. And this, I want to make sure that you all understand that we don't do research for the sake of research. Of course, many of us as scientists are are um, very excited when we're able to create something that advances science, that improves knowledge, um, that is able to, to be used um, beyond our specific setting and, and population. But the real reason to do implementation research is to do a better job at implementation, is to have a greater impact on the health and quality of life on the of the populations that we serve. And so as we talk about implementation science and implementation research, um, I, I just want us all to keep that in mind, that, that the purpose uh, for doing so is to improve practice, to improve public health practice, to improve, improve health care. Um, and so uh, let, let us start here. So I like this to start with this quote by Khalil Gibran, a little knowledge that acts is worth infinitely more than much knowledge that is idle. In research, um, in public health and medicine, we are constantly developing new technologies, new practices, new innovations that are designed to improve health. But unless those innovations are used and sustained, they will have little impact, limited impact on health. And so implementation science is a field that um, aims to get that knowledge into practice. This is important because we know that intervention impact, whatever the intervention is, is a product of not only the effectiveness of that intervention, but its reach in the population. I like to use this example of a coordinated approach to, to child health or CATCH program um, that was a program that I think is a great example of one that had longstanding impact of an intervention when it was translated into real world use. So CATCH was first developed in the 1980s and it was funded by our National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute. Um, and the, it was designed to increase healthy eating behavior and physical activity among school children, school age children. But it also was a multi-level intervention. So it includes changes at the, the, the school level and also later the, the home environment and the parent behaviors. So the program was effective, but of course, like all programs, if it's not widely disseminated and used, it cannot have the impact that it can. Ultimately, the CATCH program was um, incorporated into policy and schools, not only in Texas, but around the country, were actually required to include a program, not necessarily specifically CATCH, but like CATCH, a multi-level intervention to improve physical activity and nutrition of children. So I think that this is a good example, but unfortunately, it's a rare example of a program that was developed, it was effective, and then it, it's implemented broadly. We know that um, there is, is much research that's, that's um, completed, but between that original research and implementation, there are, are many ways to lose information and it takes a long time. So this is the, a, a graphic from this 
article that is now um, often cited when we talk about implementation research. And it represents the time it takes for new discoveries or effective interventions to be implemented as usual care or standard practice in the real world. Um, when researchers complain that practitioners pay little heed to research findings, um, we, we know that there's a lot of reasons why that is. So if you look at this slide, you can see that um, there are between original research, submission, acceptance, and publication, there's some time, but not very much. What happens here is that a lot of learned knowledge is lost. Negative results are typically not published. And what this leads to is for people continuing to test things that we already know or we should know don't work. Um, between publication and bibliographic databases to ultimately review guides and textbooks, it can take anywhere from six to 13 years. And from there to actual implementation and practice to about 9.3 years, and all the while losing much of this information. So ultimately, it takes about 17 years to turn only 14% of original research to the benefit of patient care or to public health. And so the idea of implementation science is to improve this outlook, to increase not only the amount, but the speed in which we get research into practice. The question often is who is responsible? Who's responsible for getting research into action? Is it researchers? Is it program developers? The implementers that are on the, in the field actually delivering health services and public health services? Is it the funder's responsibility? Is it politicians' responsibility? Um, let's, let's ask you that question there in the chat. If, if I could have a few people, whose responsibility do you think it is to put research into practice? I actually don't think I can see the chat while I'm presenting, but. Teamwork, everyone is responsible. All have roles to play. All stakeholders, policymakers, everyone. Well, I'm glad that you feel that way. Um, I often tell this story. Um, I've been in the field of implementation science for many, many years. And one of the first conferences that I went to was way back in uh, 2002. Hard to believe it's 20 years ago. And at this time, um, we, they had, we were talking about implementation and they divided us up. We had researchers in one room program developers and implementers in another room, the funders in another room. And we were asked the question, whose responsibility is it to put research into practice? And when we came back to talk about it, everyone said it was the other one's responsibility. So very happy to see that, um, that you all are thinking that it's a team effort and it's that everyone's responsibility. But in the past, a barrier to translation of research findings for public health benefit or for healthcare benefit is that developers, often researchers, um, practitioners, and policymakers believe that the responsibility for implementation for broad dissemination lies elsewhere. So I think that we're on the, the right track if, if people are saying that it's all of our responsibility, then hopefully we have um, representatives from a number of different backgrounds in this uh, meeting today. So let's start with some definitions. So dissemination, I'm going to talk about dissemination and implementation and then dissemination and implementation research in the, in the next slide. So dissemination refers to the broad distribution or scale of, of an innovation or intervention. And it could be to a specific audience. Um, it's usually a broad audience. So it could be for a region or a country. Um, implementation refers to the integration of a new innovation or intervention within a specific setting or context. So if you want to think about implementation as 
um, its use in a specific setting and then dissemination as broader scale up and spread. I think that that's a good way to think about it. So we talked about um, that it's not just effectiveness and or efficacy, but also broad reach in the population that influences impact. This is a, uh, a graphic um, I borrowed from a presentation from the Na National Cancer Institute. I, I have a link there in the slide that goes to a really nice training called the, the uh, uh, Training Institute for Dissemination and Implementation Research in Cancer. Um, and this is sponsored by the National Cancer Institute. But I, I recommend that you look at that because there's a lot of great presentations there and it's open access. Um, you can get a really nice foundation of, of implementation research from looking at those modules. Um, but what I wanted to say about this slide is that um, REAIM, which you'll, talk, we'll, you'll hear about when we talk about theories and frameworks tomorrow, um, REAIM stands for Reach, Effectiveness, Adoption, Implementation, and Maintenance. And I think that it's a good framework for understanding all of the different aspects that are critical for creating lasting impact. So when we talk about reach, we're asking questions about how do I reach the targeted population? Um, effectiveness, we all know about effectiveness. That's what we're usually trying to understand when we do evaluations. How do I know if a particular intervention or intervention package is effective? Adoption is um, the whether or not it is actually um, agreed if, if the organizations or regions agree to use the intervention or in innovation. And implementation is the extent to which it is used, right? So we ask questions about how do I ensure that the intervention is delivered properly? And then maintenance, or also sometimes called sustainability, is how do I incorporate the intervention so it's delivered over the long run? It, it, it really does no use to have something implemented for a short time if it's not maintained. And so questions about increasing sustainability and maintenance are also critical. So now let's talk about what do we mean by implementation science, implementation research, and dissemination research. So implementation science is really the umbrella and it's the study of methods to promote the integration of research findings and evidence into healthcare policy and practice or public health policy and practice. When we talk about implementation research, it's the study of the use of strategies to adopt and integrate evidence-based health interventions into clinical and community settings to improve patient or population outcomes. Dissemination research is the study of the targeted distribution of evidence. And when we talk about evidence, we can be talking about knowledge, interventions, practices, policies. I'm usually going to be using the term innovation or intervention, but um, you should think that this is very a very broad term that really refers to a number of different things, including policy. So in dissemination research, we are distributing evidence to a specific public health or clinical practice audience. And the, the goal is how best to spread and sustain these innovations. Many of you have probably um, uh, become familiar with these different terms, health services research, quality improvement science, quality improvement. Um, these are all terms that have sort of overlapping definitions with this broader field of implementation science. And the reason is because implementation science by definition is multidisciplinary. So we draw an implementation science from many other disciplines, including health promotion, um, including health services research, including quality improvement science, and um, commun health communication research. And then some also, there are many fields, uh, fundamental sort of fields that are involved and that can be drawn upon when we're doing implementation science. And these include fields such as obviously public 
health and medicine, but also anthropology and sociology. Um, I mentioned communications. So there's, there's many uh, people come to this field with a, quite a bit of, of background. I see some questions popping up in the chat and we will try to get to those. If I started a bit early, um, so we will try to get to some of those questions uh, when, when we're finished here. So I, I really like this graphic of um, where of dissemination and implementation research studies and explaining where they fall along this, this continuum. Um, Usually, so if you look at these axes, you have real world evidence and you'll have time. And so um, usually when we're talking about um, at the very beginning, we're trying to understand whether a program and, and here they're using the term program, but let's talk about it as innovation, intervention, whatever it is. Um, we're, in, we're asking like, could a program work? And we typically have some pre-intervention um, studies that look at the potential um, of efficacy, and then we do efficacy studies, right? And this is in typically in a very controlled setting where we're trying to see if under optimal conditions an innovation or intervention works. And we're looking at things like patient outcomes, public health outcomes, and, um, and trying to see if, uh, if there was a difference. Then we can conduct effectiveness studies, which is does asking the question, does a program work? And this is typically done, effectiveness studies are typically done in a setting that is more like the actual setting that it will be used in. So more real world. So, so as you go up, you're going more real world. And then dissemination and implementation studies encompass the work that is asking the question, what can make a program work? What can make a program get adopted, implemented, and sustained over time? And so there are a number of different phases in implementation um, and dissemination exploration where organizations are looking at and um, at, at interventions that have been shown to work, um, seeing if they're feasible, there's adoption and preparation. And this is a time that sometimes adaptation happens. We're not gonna be talking about adaptation during these first two days, but we will in the, sub in the subsequent trainings. Um, and then implementation and sustainment. So when we're doing studies to try to enhance the use and understand what factors influence implementation, what strategies can accelerate and enhance implementation and sustainment. We're in this space right here. So there are a number of different aims of implementation science. Um, it helps develop effective strategies for implementing evidence-based practice um, to improve health-related processes and outcomes. It produces generalizable knowledge about strategies and um, barriers and facilitators that can influence success or failure. And it aids in the development, testing, and refining of implementation science theories and frameworks, as well as measures to advance the field of implementation science so that you're not just getting answers about what is working here um, in a particular setting, but that that research also informs subsequent implementation efforts in your, in your own country and beyond. Luckily now we have quite a few implementation science resources. There's some books. Um, I would say the one there in the middle is, is probably the main textbook for dissemination and implementation research in health um, uh, by lead author uh, Ross Brownson. There's also one <clears throat> here on the left that, that I participated in with colleagues in advancing science of implementation across the cancer continuum. Um, and then there's also ones that are, that are more um, 
but other topics such as adolescent mental health. We also have a, several journals now in implementation science. The, the, probably the most well-known is one that's called Implementation Science, but there's also Implementation Science Communications and other journals that have, have recently come out over the last couple of years. There's a couple notable conferences and, and there, there are many more, including a global implementation research conference. Um, these are, are two that are very popular in the United States. There's a Biennial Society for Implementation Research Conference and a conference on the science of dissemination and implementation in health. Um, this conference this year is on December 14th and through 16th. Now I'm going to turn to some differences between clinical or public health research and implementation research. This is a slide that I got from Dr. Brian Mittman and is I think a really nice way of trying to understand some of the differences. We know that when people are first exposed to the field of implementation science and implementation research, there's a lot of confusion about what constitutes implementation research as compared to other types of research that I may already be doing in, in um, healthcare or public health. So well, the aims are different. So an aim in clinical or public health research are typically focused on evaluating a clinical intervention, a health promotion intervention, a policy intervention. Whereas in implementation research, they're focused, the aim is focused on implement, on, on evaluating an implementation strategy and whether that implementation strategy had an impact on getting this, what's in this first column, used in the real world. Okay, so that's the main difference between the aims. A typical intervention in clinical or public health research could be a drug, a procedure, a practice, a therapy, a prevention program. Whereas in implementation research, a typical intervention might be organizational practice change or training. Um, there are many other types of, of um, interventions or strategies, we'll, we'll be calling them strategies, to enhance implementation. So that's the focus in implementation research. Typical outcomes in clinical or public health research include symptoms, health outcomes, patient behavior, population, morbidity and mortality. These are typical outcomes in clinical and public health research. When you're talking about implementation research, you're talking about outcomes such as adoption, adherence, fidelity, the level of implementation. Of course, this leads to outcomes in health, and we'll be looking at that a little bit more closely when uh, Dr. Walker talks about implementation. The typical unit of analysis of clinical and public health research is the patient or community member, where the typical unit of analysis and implementation research is a unit. It's a clinic, a team, a facility, a school. It could be a community. There are many types of, of evidence-based interventions, and we, for short, um, in English, we often call these EBIs, evidence-based interventions. And as I mentioned before, there are many different types of, of interventions. And it's important to recognize this because the approaches that you would use for implementing one of these as, as compared to another may be quite different. But I do want to mention that when we talk about evidence-based interventions, and this is throughout, that can be implemented or disseminated, we're talking about clinical practice guidelines, clinical innovations. Um, here, I have cancer prevention education programs, but it could be any type of prevention education program. That's an example. Policies or strategies. Now, strategies, I use that term because um, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force has a community guide. Um, you can look this up at uh, communityguide.org. And they recommend broad sort of strategies for, for various topics. And so those, these broad approaches um, can also be implemented. 
there was a really nice um, paper by uh, Jeffrey Curran that came out um, a couple of years ago. And we realized that implementation science is, uh, has a lot of jargon. We use a lot of terms. We're going to be using a lot of terms during these two days and, and, um, and as we move forward with the training. But um, this, I think, is a nice way of when you get confused to, to think about it. Now, some people like this a lot and, and feel like it really helps and other people um, don't quite get it, but uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna give it a try. Um, I think it's actually very useful when you're, you're, you get a bit confused about, well, what is the evidence-based intervention and what is the implementation strategy that I'm trying to use to get the implementation intervention used. And so when uh, this slide from Jeff uh, is, talks about when defining implementation science, some very non-scientific language can be helpful. So that intervention, the practice, what we've been call, calling the EBI, the evidence-based intervention, the innovation is the thing. Okay, so that is the thing. And effectiveness research looks at whether the thing works. Right? Efficacy research or effectiveness research, does this thing work? Whatever that thing is, practice and intervention and innovation, does it work? Implementation research looks at how best to help people and places do the thing. Now that we know that it works, we want to be able to do it. We want to be able to use it in the real world. And so that's what implementation research does. How best to help people and places do the thing. And then implementation strategies are the stuff that we do to help people and places do the thing. So it's not always easy to take an innovation, to take that thing and to just to use it, especially if it's new, especially if people are unfamiliar with it, especially if people are used to doing something else. And so, so it's not enough to just know that it exists and you're able to do it but sometimes there, you need implementation strategies to help you do it. And then the main implementation outcome, when we talk about implementation research and implementation science, the main implementation outcomes are how much and how well are you doing the thing? So you're not asking, does the thing work, right? Because that was effectiveness research. That was bullet number two. You're not asking whether it works here. In implementation research, you're asking how much and how well did you do this thing? So we're gonna talk um, about hybrid designs um, in implementation research a little bit later um, in December when we talk about studies and study designs. But um, to help in our um, discussions and also to help situate where, what type of research you may be doing or you may be thinking about when you get into your small groups and beyond when you're working with your colleagues in your countries. Um, I wanted to introduce the concept here and then we're gonna talk about it a little bit more in December. Um, so this is a traditional research pipeline and it's quite similar to that other uh, graphic that I showed at the beginning where you have efficacy studies, then effectiveness studies, then implementation studies, and then scale up and spread, ultimately leading to improved processes. And this is supposed to represent a, 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 a pipeline, right? A pipeline from, from research to practice. So when we talk about hybrid designs, what we mean are effectiveness implementation hybrid designs. And so Spatially speaking, hybrid designs fall here. So it's sort of a blend between effectiveness and implementation studies. Now, um, Jeff, Jeffrey Curran, uh, several years ago now, uh, wrote a paper that talked about hybrid designs and where he presented this idea that we don't necessarily have to wait until we have perfect data perfect effectiveness evidence to begin exploring implementation, to begin understanding implementation strategies and what might work to get this thing used in the real world. 
that instead we can, oh, and also we shouldn't do effectiveness studies without testing some implementation strategies. So instead he suggested, not always, but in some cases, when you have some evidence of effectiveness, um, you are, you should, you might want to do hybrid designs. And so there are three types of hybrid designs. And these go from more like effectiveness research or more like implementation research. So keep in mind that there is pure implementation research where you're not looking at effectiveness at all. You're just looking at implementation. You're just looking at um, uh, whether or not something was used or some other implementation research outcome that we'll be talking about a little bit later. Um, and there's also pure effectiveness research where we're, you're not really looking at implementation at all. So right now I'm talking about hybrid designs where you're looking at both. So a hybrid type one is when there is a greater focus on the questions of effectiveness. So you're testing a clinical or prevention intervention and you're observing or gathering information on implementation. So you're doing both, but the primary focus is on effectiveness. Hybrid two is where there's essentially an equal focus on both understanding the effectiveness of a clinical or prevention intervention, um, and you're also studying an implementation strategy. And then hybrid type three is when you're testing implementation strategies, but you're also seeing what impact it had on uh, perhaps health outcomes or other clinical or prevention outcomes. So these are, are three types of hybrids. And I know this is very quick and we're gonna see this again, but I wanted to give you at least this terminology in case uh, this comes up in your work groups. So there's a number of different dissemination implementation research approaches, and we're gonna be talking about these again um, later when we, we talk about um, study design and research methods, but just to give you uh, an overview, we, we rely very heavily on mixed methods. And, and luckily we have um, in, our, in our teaching team here, we have some experts in mixed methods approaches. A mixed methods, by, by that we mean a mixture of both qualitative and quantitative research methods in a single study. There are a number of different ways to do that mix and to get information from both types of research. Also, we know that um, in your settings, there, it may be more appropriate for one reason or another to be doing just qualitative or just quantitative, but recognizing that mixed methods are, are really the, the best um, for implementation research. Pragmatic trials is another um, term that you'll hear a lot in implementation research. And, and pragmatic trials are trials that evaluate the effectiveness of interventions in real life practice conditions or routine settings. So I talked about the different types of hybrid designs. When you're doing a hybrid um, uh, design, you are almost always going to be doing a pragmatic trial because you're usually doing it in a real world setting. A natural experiment or, or uh, experiments that where individuals within populations are exposed to different levels of an experiment naturally, right? So we have many with the COVID-19 um, pandemic, we have many natural experiments going on um, constantly with uh, trying to see how we can best implement testing, how we can implement vaccination and observing those in a systematic way um, can constitute a natural experiment. And then we talked about hybrid designs already. So these are, these are some terms of, of, research approaches, of research approaches that you will come across when you start reading and exploring about implementation science. Um, I, I wanted to, before I, I move on, I, I meant to say this at the beginning and I, I wanted to, uh, I just remembered, um, I wanna acknowledge the fact that we know, we realize that there are probably many people on the call today that um, have quite a bit of experience in implementation science and implementation research. And so um, we recognize that. And uh, nevertheless, we wanted to, uh, and we were asked to make this training 
um, for folks that may not have as much experience in dissemination and implementation research. But because we do likely have people with a great deal of experience, we invite you to, um, when we get into our break, breakout sessions or in the chat, um, please feel free to make comments or, um, or points that, uh, that you have that, that you think may be helpful. So we're gonna be talking about theories and, and models and frameworks and implementation science tomorrow, but one of the things that I wanted to, to do today was just to, to, to say something about why we think that thinking about and learning about theories and frameworks is important. They present a systematic way of understanding uh, the world, right? Events, behaviors, um, implementation, realities, and they do that by providing interrelated concepts, def definitions, and propositions that can be used to explain or predict um, outcomes. And they typically do this by specifying relationships among variables. They're abstract, they're broadly applicable, and they're not content or topic specific, right? So those are theories. Frameworks are, are similar in that they help us understand of various factors that influence, but they, um, and they, they provide a systematic way to develop, man manage, evaluate, implement interventions, but they typically do not specify relationships between variables. And then the term model is often used to describe theories and frameworks collectively. <clears throat> They're important because they can provide a systematic structure for the development, management, and evaluation of interventions, um, inform the selection and development of implementation strategies, help you understand findings, provide guidance on measures, um, provide explanations on why interventions work or don't work, and provide an opportunity to advance our understanding of the field. We'll cover this a little bit more tomorrow, but I wanted to just give you a little bit of a preview of why we do this. Another thing that we're gonna be covering in December is um, about how do you design, develop, or choose implementation strategies? And we're specifically going to be talking about in, um, intervention mapping and implementation mapping. There are a number of different ways to design and tailor implementation strategies. This is a nice article that describes them, um, but we're gonna be focusing on implementation mapping. So intervention mapping, and some of you may have heard about this, is a, a systematic approach. It's used all over the world. There's over 1,000 publications um, using intervention mapping. Is um, a process for planning health promotion programs, and in particular, multi-level health promotion programs. So not just for the individual, but for in, um, interpersonal settings for organizations, organizational settings, policy. In implementation science, there are basically three ways that intervention mapping has been applied. One is in designing multi-level interventions in ways that enhance its potential for being adopted, implemented, and sustained. And we often call this designing for dissemination. Um, and that's the typical way that intervention mapping is used, that first way. And the second is designing implementation strategies to influence the adoption, implementation, and continuation. And that's what we call implementation mapping. Um, and that's what we're gonna be focusing on when, when we come back in December and we talk about implementing the development or choosing of implementation strategies. And then the third way that it's used that we'll also cover a little bit is using intervention mapping processes to adapt existing evidence-based intervention. So often we can't use an intervention the way that it was developed. It needs to be adapted to a new population and setting and doing it systematically is the best way to ensure that it's gonna be usable and feasible, acceptable. Um, and using IM ADAPT or implementation mapping, intervention mapping for doing that is um, one way to do it. Um, so I mentioned that implementation mapping is used 
use of the intervention mapping protocol for planning implementation strategy. There was a paper um, that we published a couple of years ago describing that. There it is. Um, and I'm going to be wrapping up here in just a moment. I wanted to say something about the implementation. So oftentimes in implementation science, we're looking at, we're studying how do you get something adopted, implemented, and maintained. But just as important as increasing the use of something that works is decreasing the use of something that does not work. So de-implementation is a study of how to remove, replace, reduce, and it could be to reduce the frequency or intensity or restrict the use of ineffective, untested, harmful, overused, inappropriate, or low value health services or practices delivered to patients or public health settings by health care providers or health systems. So this is a very important area, I think, and one that is um, a bit newer um, and less developed to that implementation science, but is gaining a lot of attention. Um, and, and I think that um, you know, we're not going to be talking about it too much in this training, but here's some, we do have some uh, reference to some papers where you can learn a little bit about it and we can, we can talk about it as well next session. So there are many needs and opportunities in implementation science. Um, these are just some of the areas. There is a lot to be learned about adaptation of evidence-based interventions, designing for dissemination, sustainability, scale-up, as I mentioned, de-implementation, policy implementation. There's a lot of methodological advances in implementation research, um, a lot to be learned about implementation of multi-level and complex interventions, and uh, implementation research to increase health equity. There's also, as I mentioned, many resources. You all will have a copy of these slides, so um, don't have to worry about copying it down right now. But these are some training programs. Um, the Global Alliance for Chronic Disease has a really nice um, training program. Um, also, the, there's a training program um, focused on cancer that is open access. I'm giving you ones that are open access. And, um, and these are some other resources. I've mentioned several of these during the talk. A website that I also think is a, 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 a very helpful is this website from um, Washington University. Uh, Implementation Science Research Hub, and, um, and there are a number of links there. So in summary, implementation science can help bridge the gap between research and practice by building an actionable and pragmatic knowledge base to help us understand the determinants of implementation and dissemination, by developing strategies to accelerate and improve scale-up and spread of effective innovations, um, and by improving healthcare and public health practice to improve, increase population health. I just want to acknowledge um, several people who shared slides. And I will stop. Great. Well, thank you, Maria. That was a wonderful presentation. One of the questions that have come up in the chat box is, uh, what's the difference between operational and implementation research? And I know Dr. Bala had given, um, given an explanation there as well, but if you could elaborate a little bit more. Yeah, I think um, that's, that's a good question. And I think like that question, there would, there's probably many others, like what is the difference between improvement science and implementation research? And, and I think that um, the, there is a tremendous overlap. Um, many of us, in fact, many of you will probably realize as we're talking about this, that in, what, in some ways you have been doing implementation research for some time. And so I think that um, in, in operational research and improvement science, there are many similar questions because you're trying to understand what works um, in, in getting something used um, and what is, what is the impact of, of that and how can you improve practice? Um, so many of the questions are, are very similar. Um, some of the methods and some of the approaches and some of the measures and some of the terms 
you'll find are, are a bit different. But, um, but I think that the goals are very similar. The second question that has popped up is why hybrid methods are focused on clinical settings? They're, they're not. They're not just focused on clinical settings. And, um, and if that came across in the slide, that's my fault. Um, some of these slides are borrowed and I try to, every place that it said clinical, um, I tried to put clinical or public health, and, but I may have missed them. So my apologies if that's the case. Um, a lot of implementation science has been conducted in clinical settings. However, these concepts, the majority of these concepts, these approaches, the theories and frameworks, they can be applied to clinical practice settings. They can also be applied to and are being applied to public health settings. And so when we're talking about hybrid designs, when you're looking at um, both the effectiveness and implementation and have research questions about those. Those are not just, you can do those not just in clinical settings, but also in community settings, um, public health settings. Thank you for pointing that out. Okay, a few more questions have come in. Um, are we going to cover more on methods advanced, such as adaptive design, big data, in a coming session, and then should hybrid designs more often than not include some elements of effectiveness slash implementations as well? Yeah, so let me answer the second one first. Um, so yes, hybrid designs definitely include elements of effectiveness and implementation research. I mean, that's the definition of a hybrid design. So they would have outcomes that are related to both effectiveness and implementation. Um, you would, you would use research methods that were associated with effectiveness studies and implementation studies, measures, et cetera. Um, as far as the, um, the design, yes, we are going to be um, covering uh, research designs. I'm gonna say a little bit about adaptive, adaptive design, specifically SMART, um, sequential multiple assignment randomized trials. I'll give an example of that. But um, as this uh, training is um, a, a fairly uh, um, sort of basic training on implementation, implementation science, we're, we're not going to go into great depth about um, uh, those more advanced research design topics. Well, I think the, the um, last set of questions before we move on to the next topic uh, for your presentation is evidence gathering for de implementation acceptable to policymakers and implementers? And is there a prerequisite to implementation research? Um, I am not sure I understand the question about gathering evidence for de implementation. Um, I think, I, I, I think that in order for um, to embark in a de-implementation effort, there's usually strong evidence of one of those things that I had on the slide, that something is harmful, ineffective, um, you know, those, that's sort of the criteria. And so if that criteria exists, or if you're talking about gathering information to see if something should be de-implemented, then I think that that, that is appropriate. Um, but I'm not sure I understood that question. Um, is there a prerequisite to implementation research? Um, I'm not quite sure if you mean, uh, is there a prerequisite to learning about implementation research or if there is a prerequisite to doing implementation research? Um, I would say, uh, you know, a prerequisite to learning implementation research is to have some knowledge of research in general, because obviously we're not um, covering the basic topics about research and scientific method, et cetera. Um, or, uh, but, but I think other than that, as I mentioned, this training is designed for people who may be new to implementation research. So there's not really a prerequisite for that. If you're talking about, is there a prerequisite for conducting implementation research? Um, I think that having some evidence 
uh, that an innovation or intervention has worked is probably the prerequisite because otherwise you're not doing implementation research, you're just doing effectiveness research. Now we talked about hybrid trials and hybrid type one where you may be studying effectiveness and that's okay. But um, usually even in that case, you have some evidence that, that it's promising, that the intervention is promising or, or that has some impact. Okay, I think we probably should move to, um, are we, are, oh, are we, are we ahead of schedule? No, we are about 10 minutes behind. Okay, all right. Yeah, I thought that was too good to be true. Okay. Um, all right, any, we'll have, we'll have time for, um, for more questions. Okay, so, uh, I'm jumping to my next uh, talk. Is that right, Amanda? Yes. And for those questions we didn't um, get answered, uh, we will just save on, hold on to them, and we will get them addressed. Uh, and if some of the other faculty members in the audience, if y'all are able to, if you could go ahead and answer those, those would be that would be great. Share my screen. 